It, it, well, it's good. It's good to be here and go down memory lane. Thank you, Jamara, for uh, contacting me. The pleasure is truly mine. You've come a long way uh, since Gary, Indiana. Yeah, 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 yeah. Early days, humble days um, uh, from Gary, Indiana, home of the Jackson Five, home of the first um, African American mayor of a major city. Um, which I am proud to say that my dad helped convince him to run for office. And I am right now mm -hmm. sat on a street named after my father. And I've always been a Garyite, but I've always uh, been happy to represent the local area, which obviously got me to Chicago, Chi-Town in those early days and intertwined with music and discovering some beats, which later on became house. Before we get into house music, tell me about your earliest memories of singing. Oh gosh, my earliest memories of singing uh, would have to be Jubilee Showcase on a Sunday afternoon, which was like a gospel uh, before uh, Bobby, Bobby the oh. Black Guy has the gospel show. Before him, there was Jubilee Showcase. And in the summertime, before you got ready to go to Easter church and put on your outfit and all of that, the windows would be open, all the neighbors would be playing Jubilee Showcase, and you'd hear like the Mississippi Blind Boys, and you hear the mm -hmm. bands, all of that stuff coming out of everybody's house. So you mm -hmm. didn't even have to have your television or radio on. You'd hear the music through the street. So that was that. I had a house full of music. My father loved um, uh, the older singers like Dinah Washington, Billy Eckstein, the impressions. My mom loved Nancy Wilson. Music all around my family, my aunts and everybody on the weekend got together after work and had parties at each other's homes. So we grew up with family every weekend, all the cousins, all everybody get dressed up and just go to auntie this house or auntie that house. So that was music. And and then I grew up not too far from the Jacksons. So from their, from their rehearsal space. Um, so Gary, Indiana was just full of music. <laughs> and then when did you realize that you could sing? Yeah, I think I used to just um, sing along to every commercial on TV. I am stuck on Band-Aid because Band-Aid <laughs> stuck on me. Oh. I'm stuck on Band-Aid because Band-Aid stuck on me. And I just sing all day, all these different kind of commercials. And I and it just was normal, you know, my baloney has a first name. You know, so all of this kind of stuff, you just repeat. And it didn't come to me as a voice, but it just, um, it was just something I did all the time and I think it clicked that it was a rhythm or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking from like four or five years old, this kind of thing. And I'm talking from like in the sixties, the early sixties where, you know, well, no, I don't pay no attention to you to put you on no TikTok or this and that. Go be quiet, go do your own work. And that, and, and, and that was it. <laughs> so, um, but, it, but it wouldn't go away. And um, I sang in church for a little while. But I was more hooked on like Aretha Franklin, Gladys Knight, um, Millie Jackson, I could keep Turner. I was like, oh, they ain't singing like that in the church. So I just was like, let me just stay home on Sunday and listen to music all day. Right. And I just kind of started listening to, you know, Aretha Franklin, All the King's Horses, the B-sides. I was a B-side girl too. C-side, D-side, B-side. Because it was something, I think all during that time too, all of our sides were B-sides because radio had not really picked up a lot of Black music in the mainstream. So you just, you know, you got everything, you know, coming through the house because they were trying to fit in. We had our own community. I always tell people we should have just kept the Chitlin circuit because that was our group. We owned all of that. We had our own clubs. We had our own restaurants. We cooked our own food. We had our own brands. We had our own everything. And everybody kind of put it down with language and degraded it to seem like you didn't belong unless you crossed over and crossing over meant you got to let go what's in your hand of what we owned back then. And, and we still don't get it. I'm like, no. So, so a lot of that I was beneficial mm -hmm. from, from living in a chocolate city near Chicago because all of the music came through 
all the artists, Gladys Knight, The Temptations. The, you know, he's just like a little kid hearing it on the radio. And they were doing interviews. Oh, I'm coming through, Gary. Or we at Chicago at the High Chaparral. Or blah, blah, blah. We'll be in New York next week. Da, 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 da. You know, and it just be on our little radio stations. I can't remember if it was AM or FM. You just hear it. And it was very exciting. And then you see how your family would move around when they hear about these artists coming and they start playing the records more. And, and I just was picking up on, on all of that. And then um, Ed Sullivan's show, Jackson 5 on there the first time. And I can Tina Turner. And you see all of this energy. You go like, oh my gosh. You just point to the TV. There it is. That's that's it. So yeah, <laughs> I I love that. I mean, what a what a landscape of artists to be absorbing in your formative years, right? And, and absorbing it for the first time, like as the world is also meeting these artists. You know, your your coming of age and and being blown away equally. I love that. I remember did, did watching you... my uncles though, like when um, Ike and Tim Turner would come on, you know, with mm -hmm. the Ikeets. I remember watching their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you know, you got Tina Turner and them skirts yeah. skirts so short. And I was like, that me, you know, because I'm watching how they look at, they don't they don't they don't look at uh Barbara Streisand like that. Clearly a different kind of thing, you know. And then I grew up around the blues as well. You know, you had all the Chicago blues, Johnny Lee Hooker and uh uh Bobby Rush, uh, uh all these different, like really, really blues singers, uh Big Mama Thornton. My mom was telling me the other day she went you know, to see her. And this is like before Elvis stole Hound Dog. This is like just the raw, raw, raw. And you just like, what? That's so, so interesting that you mentioned the blues. I was listening to some of your music and I was thinking about lyrics and vocals and so, so many of your songs actually like, actually have a strong blues element because when I think of the blues, I think of one being unapologetic, right? And then two people being real, like about heartbreak, about love, about like, I've given you way too many chances, you know, like, and I, I feel like I felt some of that in, in, yeah. in many of the, the lyrics and, and choruses that you've, that you've sung on, on albums. Oh, thank you. I think, I, you know, that's that Bobby Blue Bland coming through. <laughs> and that sassy Millie Jackson, you know, kind of stuff coming through. And then you had like um, Betty Wright, you mm. know, the clean up woman and all these different, you know, type type of vocals. And then because some artists weren't allowed like a crossover thing back in that day because they might have been to what they would call raunchy or whatever. Uh, and they had a touring history. You know, they toured, they were everywhere right. where you could see them live. And uh, I didn't understand any of that stuff then. I just heard the records because my aunties had everything. I mean, I remember when um, Red Fox and Richard Pryor recorded and they had records. They would play those jokes too. And yeah, they get to have the album from Richard Pryor or the album from Dolomite, <laughs> all of this stuff. And it'd be music behind it and it'd be jokes and it'd be our community on a Friday or Saturday night, um, by that time they thought the kids had went to sleep and maybe we didn't, but it was just our culture. My aunts were nurses and RNs and my uncles worked in the steel mill. So they, you know, they, they pay tax paying people, nice middle class, uh, black families mm. so on the weekend. That's how they had that fun, you know, which was beautiful. And, um, yeah, and they dress up too. They they dress up. They put like your jeans and your hairdo just to go to your cousin's house. It'd be twenty people in the house. It's amazing. I, I love that. You know, I um, I, I I tell the story sometimes. I grew up in a house where we had a nightclub in the basement, and like I so I can like visualize exactly what you're talking about. It's like people took so much like pride not only in their day jobs but also in spending time and creating communities together and like and and you yeah. did get dressed you did get dressed up and you did you know you did want to feel special and fly and beautiful and handsome and like you did want to like flex because like that was your downtime it was your downtime and and you know like the local musician who might have been in town might have came by because my aunt may have known him or some of the the, the local um artists in the neighborhood because before back then we had um regional radio mm. so in the region whatever the big group was or act they were played on our radio stations 
We did, you know, they would build their uh, audience from that. They would play at the local clubs on different times. They might open up for the main acts, but they had a radio presence. And so, and they lived in the community. Nobody, you know, they weren't um, written off of the playlist for radio back then. You had, like, like uh, Jerry Butler and Br Brenda Lee Egger, I always remember that. That was like a Chicago thing, that whole song, Ain't Understanding Mellow, and all of that. That was a regional Midwest kind of thing. And mm. then he crossed over to different parts of the uh, uh, states little by little, but we cultivated all our artists and took care of them and went to see them and, and supported them. So they might be at your house on a, on a Saturday night or Friday night. And, you know, some of the neighbors might come by. I remember like maybe one of the neighbors might have been having a difficult time with whatever, um, rent, money, laid off, whatever. You'd hear soft knock at the door and mm. your uncle or somebody take them to the side room and they find out uh, like, oh, girl, come on down here. Uh, this is my neighbor, blah, 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 blah. Uh, right. You know, and then everybody just do quietly when she left an envelope will go in her hand. Remember mm. these kind of things. Uh, you, you're going to make me cry now. Our community um, ran like that. And that story just reminded me of a particular woman because I still remember her. She's not with us now, but I do like remember the kindness of my family and, and just neighborhood spirit. It didn't have to be just one block. It, it could be like in a one mile radius of everybody. Mm. So. Yeah, so that's a good memory. <laughs> what you're talking about is that the music was not separate from community. You could have deep, rich community that cared for each other, right? And this like rich fellowship in music together. And, and food. And, and food and care and probably laughter and probably some dancing and some shaking and some, you know, all the, all the things that, you know, bring us joy and humanity. You know, yeah, and beautiful. and you could you could be together. You didn't have to be in another space. You were you felt black or you felt like weird or other because people you know were were so focused on race. I don't even think I because Gary Indiana was like ninety percent black, and I I, mm -hmm. I only grew up with black mayor, black um, police officers. Everybody was um, you know black and brown because we had Latin community and lived right next door to us too as well and everybody was very very close so if there was any problems um they just called big mama <laughs> okay and you didn't want the police officer nobody said tell your grandmother to come downstairs you'd be like no 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 go big mama don't do that like, take him down there let him spend the night you know or whatever whatever it was and and, and they went to church with us the police officers and and you know the the firemen and 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 the, the mailmen and the mailmen like during the weekend may be the head of the little league team and all this and this is the 60s the 70s and the 80s i'm talking about it's so important that you said that because i think people forget that like black communities and communities of color can regulate themselves Right, like, like, <laughs> like, you know, we can work through regular community issues. Absolutely, and every and nobody was like accidentally shot and blah blah exactly. blah. You beat up some, you have a fight, a fist fight, you live a fight another day. Um, you know, I mean, you had some, you still had a little bit of ignorance of whatever would happen with the Saturday Night Special, whatever that might happen. You know, the odd thing, but not like what I'm looking at now. I'm like horrified when I come back to America. I'm like, what? I, I, it takes me a minute to, um, to, to get over the culture shock. It's just like crime and punishment, crime and punishment, all day, all night on the news. I'm like, well, and then the TV shows are the same. I'm like, are they trying to make it a thing that you right. can never, and you never recover? You just, and then, you know, so of course you got some mental, whatever issues, and everybody got them black, white, Puerto Rican, everybody you know, need some like counseling. I'm like, dang, I mean, in the UK, we got a different kind of thing, but we got ours too, trust and believe. Right. So I'm just like, back in the day, like you said, we regulated ourselves. Um, we got on, we had industry, we had, um, you learned a craft, you learned a skill in school so that when you got out, you had a job or you'd go into an, in, into an internship or an apprentice Ship mm -hmm. with the you know electricity or plumbing or this or that, mm -hmm. and you might start a small little business and you weren't embarrassed about doing that. You were winning, right. so you know I'm like, uh. or or did you know that your path was leading you to music in terms of a career, or did you maybe you wanted to do something else? <laughs> 
Um, it was always, always music. And I listened to all kinds of music. Like um, coming, like like all just about coming into my early teens, the rock and roll stuff was coming through WLS radio in Chicago, which we listened to all the time. So you would hear your like Led Zeppelin and music. You'd hear your um, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, and all that kind of music. And the stories in that, and like some of the vocalists in there, because I, I I love storytelling. So I guess some of these and album covers. I loved album covers. Mm. Like people don't remember going to the record store and just looking at an album cover, maybe picking the record from the cover. Ever even heard of the person like um, Ohio Players or Parliament yeah. Funkadelic? Some of those covers you'd be like. But I just got involved like Janis Joplin with Big Brother and the holding company, Alice Cooper, um, a School's Out for Summer. You know, all of these different kind of, uh, Helen Reddy, Angie Baby, um, mm. James Taylor, um, all, all of these different kind of, Carol King tapestry album. You know, I, I could go on, Latine Price Opera. I just started, that just kind of, Grace Brombury, you know? What I mean, I, it's just like all of these um, voices are in 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 the in the air. Saxophone players, um, you know, uh, Grover Washington Jr. Instrumental ears were open, and nothing else could penetrate. But numbers, numbers was another thing. So I started taking computer programming really early. Okay. Binary and Fortran, because it was like music theory. In my mm. head, in my head, it was like something about number, and I, that, my dad was good with numbers, so I think that was just something. And then rhythm, of, the rhythm of music. So once I started doing music theory, it was like you know, sixteenth notes, thirty-second notes, um, you know, different time signatures in in the um, in the sheet music, and um, you know, Dorian mode, Aeolian mode. You're going into these different like sounds, majors and minors and, you know, tones and rhythm again, numbers, syncopations, number and rest. Mm. And there was like even a symbol for that, just sitting on the music scale, there was just a rest. And you just didn't move or anything. And the same with Binary Fortran, when you were doing a program that was rest mm. and then it go back again. So anyway, it was numbers and rhythm and heartbeat and solar systems and just the body, uh, the way we move. Remember that that song, Walking in Rhythm, Moving in Sound? That that song always got, because I'd walk like in my life, like I'd go outside, put my shorts on, ride on my bike, get wet up. Everything was like, I was walking in rhythm, moving in sound. And mm. that's something that um, I, I've been like since, since uh, as, as uh, Lauren Hill said, since creation. I love that. So, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll backtrack to your history and how we got to the first lady of houses a title. I'm curious though. Now I'm really curious. So what role do you think vocals play in house music, right? Because house music is this like this, this mashup of like beat and sound. And I'm sure, you know, like soulful house is also like R and B and soul and gospel. So for you, what is really the power of vocals within house music? House, when it first started, was just jacked up a little bit. Jack, 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 jack your body. Even before jack, 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 jack your body, jack your body. <laughs> Even before that came on the thing, it was like really broken Casio pianos, Casio tone things that was getting this, you know, new music for the kids over on the north side of Chicago, um, you know, and it just did. It had something, but it was missing something. And that was vocals. And even mm. when the worst vocalist or whatever was put on top of it, something happened. You know, it, it, it could just be a few little words. And then it wasn't just the singing, it was spoken word as well. It wasn't about being in totally in tune because a lot of the early house singers just had a vibe on it. Mm. We're rocking down the house. You know, that kind of thing. It was just like, 
uh, some kind of thing. And in my house, with house music, you have this and everybody in my house, you know, so right. you have all those kind of things. And then you had Gerald Pandy and Farley Jack Master Funk with them. That's when it got a little bit more whatever. Now this is how it started. My dreams are broken mm -hmm. up and I want you, baby. So it got a little more cabaret-ish, a little bit more dance floor where people learned lyrics to sing along, you know, because we didn't have that either. Vocals played a very, a very big thing with communicating what the rhythm was. And a lot of the vocal rhythm may have been like the line of the melody of the bass that began to be the spoken, you know, because a lot of it began. Uh, Liz Torres was doing early-ish house. Liz was before um, Lisa, Lisa Coke Jam. She was before, right. I wonder if I take you home. <laughs> she was mm -hmm. before that, but like I said, regional music, Chicago. I was at, um, at the time I was at Mundelein College and all women's Catholic college living in a dorm with my nine month old daughter. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I would go to these different places, I guess where they would test cassettes out. And it was really early. I don't even think Frankie had got here yet. Um, it was probably Ron, Hardy, or something. It was in the gay clubs on the north side. And I was doing an um, internship at Columbia College, which was downtown. Yeah. And then I found that Columbia College, downtown Chicago, had everything involving music. You could learn to read contracts. Uh, uh, Linda Minch was teaching that, and I took her class. You could learn how to promote concerts. They had every internship. So I went everywhere, DJ International Records, interns there. Uh, Rachel, Screaming Rachel, I interned at her club. Uh, and Larry Sherman, Tracks Records, I interned everywhere. And these things were still on acetate and instrumental pretty much. And you come in and play it, people dance, and then they take you to the Hot Mix 5. They play it on the radio, blah, blah, blah. And then the vocals, like I said, start coming in with Robert Owens, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then myself with uh, Marshall Jefferson and Taste My Love which was on my label, because for one of my projects at school, I um, linked in with Donnie Johnson and Dwayne Powell, and uh, we had a label called Police Records, and that's the label Taste My Love came on. That's the song that uh, the DJs used to come over at that time from New York, London, and all these places and get the Chicago records to take them back, because we were first house. People was like, what's all this jacking? What does that mean? Because they were about jack, jack, jack. And, it ended up all over the radio, unbeknownst to me. The radio was underground, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Um, Adonis had just come back from London. He had his work permit. I saw David Levy's name on there, said, Adonis, please, can I call this number? And, you know, because I'd like to go over there too. And all the boys were going, none of the girls, me and Xavier were like, what's up? And, you know, so I called this guy, David Levy, and I was like, hey, my name is Kim Zell, blah, blah, blah. I, got, I want to come to London. I got this little record. And then he stopped me, said, are you Kim Mazzella May Taste My Love? I was like, um, yes. <laughs> He's like, you have a number one record over here. I'm gonna put you on this little tour thing and you coming over. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was underground on pirate radio where it was number one, not mainstream. Mm -hmm. It was a yeah. whole other thing. But the underground was running <laughs> the streets. It was running the streets. So when I came over, to do this little house tour. I think it was me, Marshall, Frankie Knuckles, and Orange Juice Jones. That was the first time I went. And all these labels were, and people, I, I just thought it was a, crowd, a room full of people. I didn't know people were coming to, I didn't realize I was showcasing. I didn't realize blah, blah, blah. And next thing I get like nine people asking me to sign to a label. And uh, then this guy from EMI asked me to go in the studio to write a record, me and Marshall. I uh, went in, ended up doing two, and the next thing you know, I had a five album record deal with EMI Records oh worldwide gosh. for house music for, I think it was 500,000 pounds, five albums. And that was the first major deal for a house artist to go uh, mainstream. So well, that was- look, Well, praise be. That, I mean, that's amazing. That's how First Lady of House came. I was the first 
a house artist to be signed to a major label. This is serious, house heads. Hey, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Black House, Black Joy podcast. Oh, trust and believe we have the best production team on the planet. Special thanks to our producer, Shana Wakefield, our editor, Kaylee Hepworth, our associate producer, Shantaya King and Natalia Dumont, photography by Kano El Neen, music by DJ Ron V and Rosemary Mantry. Black House Black Joy podcast is a production of WBGO Studios. Gratitude for production assistance from Corey Goldberg. If you are enjoying this content, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And until then, we'll see you next time in the house that New Jersey built. Talk about house music.